The Olympic Games always include a degree of drama, something the iconic ABC television program The Wide World of Sports, which aired between 1961 and 1998, called The Thrill of Victory and the Agony of Defeat. But not all the drama occurs inside a stadium. In 1916, the Olympic Games, which had been scheduled to be held in Berlin, were cancelled due to the Great War. And in 1920, the world looked to a new hope for peace, with Olympic Games to be held in Antwerp, Belgium. But Belgium and the world were far from recovered from that war. And for a promising American team, the drama came in just trying to get to the Games. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The 1920 Olympics occurred at a unique time. Belgium had made a bid for the 1920 Olympics at the 13th session of the International Olympic Committee in 1912, held in Switzerland before the 1912 Games, which were held in Sweden. But Belgium at the time could not know the momentous events that would intervene. In fact, in 1912, the committee decided to hold the 1916 Games in Berlin, capital of the German Empire, games that were canceled because of the outbreak of the Great War. In June 1914, there was a meeting of the Olympic Congress in Paris, held to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Olympic movement. During the Congress, the bids for 1920 were considered, and the committee at the time appeared to favor a bid to hold the Games in Budapest. But all Olympic business was suspended between 1915 and 1918 because of the war, and despite their 1912 bid, the committee had not officially selected Antwerp before the war. Germany invaded Belgium in August 1914 at the outset of the war, and Antwerp, the city in which the 1920 Olympics were to be held, and a critical strategic fortress known as the Belgian National Redoubt, was besieged and bombarded. The city capitulated in October. The mistreatment of Belgian civilians by the invading Germans was so extreme that it became called the Rape of Belgium, although the extent of atrocities committed might have been exaggerated by the Allies for propaganda purposes. During the German military occupation, Belgium, as an occupied state, was subject to the Allied naval blockade. They suffered from economic collapse, widespread unemployment, and shortages of critical commodities. Imperial Germany forced the Belgian population into forced labor. Germany demanded revenue to pay the cost of occupation, and unable to raise enough via taxation, the Belgian government printed more money, leading to widespread inflation. Germany demanded supplies of metal to feed the war effort, which then caused the collapse of Belgian industry because of the lack of raw materials. Belgium, put simply, was in no shape to support an Olympic bid. Still, when the city of Lyon, France, considered making a bid for the 1920 Olympics in 1915, itself an optimistic move as there was no guarantee that the war would be over by 1920, they offered support to their occupied ally, agreeing to hold their bid until 1924 if Antwerp was liberated in time to prepare for the Games, and still interested in hosting them. While a part of Belgium was liberated in the Allied Hundred Day Offensive in the fall of 1918, most of Belgium wasn't liberated until the armistice. Still, the International Olympic Committee decided to award the 1920 Games to Antwerp. The decision might seem odd. Not only was Belgium largely crippled by the war, but as author James Coote's 1972 book A Picture History of the Olympics notes, Belgium didn't have much of a sporting culture or sports facilities appropriate for the Games. Belgium also had only two short years to plan the Games, yet the committee chose Belgium nonetheless. Part of the decision was that countries that had joined the Central Powers, including Hungary, were not even invited to the 1920 Games, ending the Budapest bid that had been favored back in 1914. The decision also had to do with Europe. According to Olympics.com, the official website of the Olympic Games, the 1920 Games were awarded to Antwerp to honor the suffering that had been inflicted on the Belgian people during the war. A newspaper headline in France read, Belgium, didn't they earn the Games? Britannica.com also explains that part of the goal was to help the economies of Europe, struggling after the ravages of war and a post-war depression, saying, The 1920 Olympics was awarded to Antwerp in hopes of bringing a spirit of renewal to Belgium, which had been devastated during World War I. The Games were a reflection of the times. A July 2020 article by the Associated Press notes that when the Olympic Games resumed after World War I, the event was not designed to escape the horrors of war. The Antwerp Games were used to remember. Still, the Games represented notable firsts. These were the first Games where the iconic Olympic flag with the five rings, designed by De Corbin and unveiled in 1912, would be displayed. Notably, the five rings represent five continents, Europe, Asia, Africa, Oceania, and America. Using the definition of continents widely taught in Europe, yet peculiar to we Americans, where North and South America are considered a single continent. The 1920 Games would also be the first to include the statement of the Olympic Oath at the start of the Games. 
the solemn oath to take part in the Olympic Games in the spirit of chivalry for the honor of our country and for the glory of sport, recited by an oath taker from the host nation and on behalf of all athletes, officials, or coaches at the Games, is still a tradition, although somewhat changed today. In many ways, the 1920 Olympics would represent the goals set by the Olympic Congress in 1914, which the website Olympedia describes as the first that could be considered a model for modern Olympic Congresses. The purpose of the Congress was to unify regulations and eligibility rules, most notably the rules regarding amateurism that would define the Olympic Games until professional athletes began to be allowed to compete in certain sports in 1984. The 1920 Olympics would also feature innovations in terms of games, featuring a week of winter sports, including figure skating, and for the first time in Olympic history, ice hockey. This would be instrumental in the decision to hold a separate Winter Olympic Games, starting in 1924. But the 1920 Olympics also included a unique set of athletes. As the Associated Press explains, the war had changed the games, writing, Many athletes were veterans. The opening ceremony celebrated military might as much as peace. Notably, many of the athletes from previous games were now gone, the Associated Press continues. Many Olympians from the last games in 1912 have been killed or wounded during the war, when amateur gentlemen athletes flocked to serve as military officers. Yet more athletes were killed by the Spanish flu pandemic that had ravaged the world soon after. Thus, the 1920 Olympics represented a new generation of competitors, many of whom were recent veterans of the war, to end all wars. This was certainly true in the United States, whose team included some of America's greatest Olympians competing in their first Olympic Games, including boxer Eddie Egan, rower Jack Kelly Sr., Hawaiian swimmer Duke Kahanamaku, and sprinter Charlie Paddock, as well as the United States' first women's Olympic swimmers, all powerful athletes, although the press seemed to treat them more like contestants in a beauty pageant. As with athletes from other countries, a great many in the American team were either veterans or serving in the military. But the war would affect the American team in a way that it didn't affect most of their competitors. Transatlantic travel had not yet recovered, and for the Americans it was a challenge just to get to the games. In 1920, transatlantic travel was down 60% from pre-war years, and the American team simply couldn't guarantee accommodations aboard private steamers. The Olympic Committee appealed to the military, which still had control of many transatlantic steamers, which had been commandeered as troop transports. The Navy offered to transport the 76 contestants who were serving the United States Navy aboard the armored cruiser USS Frederick. Frederick had spent 1919 returning troops to the American Expeditionary Force from France, and the Navy agreed to carry the Olympic team as part of a training cruise for naval reservists. The rest of the team, including those serving in the Army, the women, and civilians, would be conveyed on a U.S. Army troop ship, the six-year-old 9,708-ton displacement USS Northern Pacific. Launched in 1915, the Northern Pacific had been built for the Great Northern Pacific Steamship Company to operate a route between Astoria, Oregon, and San Francisco. The ship had been acquired by the United States Shipping Board during the war, and served as a troop transport. The Northern Pacific was a relatively fast modern vessel, but in May 1920, the Northern Pacific had run aground in Puerto Rico while carrying General of the Army's John J. Pershing on an inspection tour. The damage was more severe than the Army realized, and at the last minute, the Great Northern was determined not to be seaworthy and required dry dock repairs. The Olympic Committee had to throw together a new plan. The July 10, 1920 edition of the New York Times announced radical changes in the sailing plans of the American Olympic team. The voyage would be made, the Times explained, on the United States Army transport, Princess Matoika. The 20,500 ton displacement Matoika was 20 years old, having been launched in 1900. Originally built for the Hamburg American Line, the ship had been a transport between the port of Hamburg and the Far East, sailing under the name Princess Alice for the North German Lloyd Line. The ship had put into the port of Cebu in the Philippines in August of 1914. The Philippines were, at the time, an unincorporated territory of the United States, and as a neutral non-belligerent, the U.S. interned the vessel. When the U.S. entered the war, the ship was seized and made into a troop transport and renamed USS Princess Matoika. There is a disagreement as to the meaning of the name, with some claiming that the ship was named after a member of the Philippine royal family, but the generally accepted explanation is that Matoika was another name for Pocahontas. The Princess Matoika had served with the Navy during the war as a troop transport, and all carrying more than 21,000 U.S. troops overseas in six voyages. In 1919, the ship had been used to return thousands of troops home to the United States, as well as returning German POWs to Europe. In September 1919, the ship was transferred from the Navy to the Army and made a U.S. Army troop transport. 
Well, the ship had continued to return troops. In the spring and summer of 1920, the ship was also used to return U.S. war dead for burial. In May, the ship had carried the remains of 10 U.S. nurses and over 400 U.S. soldiers who had died in the war, and then the remains of another 881 soldiers in July. Having to replace the USS Northern Pacific at the last minute, there was little time for turnaround. The greater part of the U.S. Olympic team would be traveling on a ship that had earned the moniker the Death Ship, which still smelled of formaldehyde. The change meant that the ship would leave six days later than planned, making the team search for accommodations for Olympians who had already reached New York. The delayed schedule meant that the American team would be among the last to arrive in Belgium, allowing other teams more time to practice there. Still, the newspapers offered an optimistic view, with the Times describing the ship as being amply suited for the purpose of transporting America's athletes. The paper reported that every athlete will have an entire berth section to himself, with ample room for his personal equipment. The reality, however, did not match the hype. In fact, naval historian Joe Hartwell writes, The Princess Matoika was a last-moment stand-in. She was ancient, slow-moving, and far from ideal. But there were no other options for the Olympic Committee. In his 1932 autobiography, Charlie Paddock described the ship getting underway. The Princess Matoika stumbled out of the harbor, silent and slow, like a proud old lady with the heebie-jeebies. Rather than every athlete getting a berth, as the New York Times had reported, the Los Angeles Times reported that the members of the Olympic Committee and the Army officers detailed to accompany the team were assigned first-class cabins, but members of the team had to bunk below decks. The accommodations were essentially those used to carry troops, and the website The Olympians opined that for Paddock and the Americans, getting to Antwerp must have felt like a flashback of the war. And conditions were so poor that the LA Times noted on July 29th that, owing to the heat of the lower decks, first place runners for the tryouts for the marathon runners, cyclists, and sprinters had been transferred to the sick bay. Runner Joey Ray was quoted in the LA Times. If those in charge had deliberately tried to create a psychology of depression and resentment among the members of the team, they could not have done anything more effective. Paddock wrote, the athletes never lingered in their dressing, as athletes will often do, but hurried with frantic haste to breathe some purer air and leave that stifling hole, thick with the reeking past and powerful proof of the ship's recent cargo. The food was also described as terrible, and Paddock noted that breakfast was not as enjoyable as dinner on the previous evening, and lunch was poor, and the meals from then on grew steadily worse. Swimmer Norman Ross described the ship as dirty, vermin written, especially with rats, with poor service, poor quarters, and insufficient sanitary arrangements, and an incompetent crew. While there was discontent from the start, Paddock notes that the position of the athletes soured notably when they learned of a wireless message to the committee saying that the conditions in Antwerp were even worse than those on the ship. He wrote, after six days slow sailing, the Olympic athletes were but halfway across the Atlantic. They were discontented and restless, and it only needed a match to start the blaze. The athletes met in what Paddock described as the most dismal hold in the vessel and established a committee to create a list of demands. The list of complaints exonerated the government, the Army Transportation Service, and noted that the officers and men of the Princess Matoika have done everything possible under the circumstances to lessen the hardships of our voyage. Rather, the athletes blamed the members of the Executive Committee of the American Olympic Committee for lack of foresight. While there was some talk of boycotting the games if conditions were not better in Brussels, the St. Louis Star and Times reported that the protest they declare is to make certain that Olympic competitors in the future will have better accommodations, and that the fight will be continued after the men are back in America. More than 100 athletes signed the document and suggested that many of the members who were serving in the Army agreed but could not sign. The group made 200 copies of the complaint, addressing one to the U.S. Secretary of War and providing copies to the press. In the end, what came to be called the mutiny on the Matoika was nothing more than an opportunity to publicly air some grievances about conditions that at that point couldn't fairly be changed. And the call for boycott seemed to fade away, even though many argued that the conditions in the Belgian schoolhouse where the Americans were housed during the games were just as bad as those on the ship. Inside the games noted, the stadium was not completed in time due to the shortage of money and building materials. Rather than a luxurious billet in the athlete's village, athletes slept in fold-down cots in an abandoned school. Instead of climate-controlled coaches, they traveled to their heats in finals in a ramshackle lorry. Still, the Americans did all right. As Paddock wrote, records would be broken, athletic fame won, and among the Americans standing on the upper deck waiting to disembark were some who would win lasting glory. Among those was, of course, he himself, winning two gold medals and a silver. The women swimmers brought home seven medals. The Americans dominated the games, winning 95 medals, 
31 more than second place Sweden, even though some of America's competitors who were favored to win had underwhelming performances. The 1920 games can be said to be, well, creatures of their time. The games were poorly attended, the ticket prices were too high, and the cash-strapped Belgian government lost some 600 million francs hosting the games. And yet, for the Belgians and the Americans and the International Olympic Committee, perhaps what is most extraordinary is that the games were held at all, being as they were indelibly tied against the backdrop of the devastating war. Sometimes a race is a win merely by having been run. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.